Hi, and welcome to Showcase, TRT World's flagship arts and culture program, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Locked away for 50 years after Frida Kahlo's death, a collection that has never before been exhibited outside Mexico is on display at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. Later in the show, we'll step into the world of the Mexican artist with a retrospective that has her personal artifacts and clothing on display. But first... A keen eye for art. Celebrating nearly half a century of Art Basel as the Swiss Contemporary Art Fair opens its doors to the world once again. The minuets forward, three faces on tripping bees' feet. Tout le monde en avant, bravo rose. Tout le monde en place. Bloomsday is a day for the few who actually finished Ulysses and the rest of us mortals who love James Joyce. For James Joyce fans across the world, June 16th is Bloomsday, the day one of the most difficult and most revered novels is celebrated grand style. Ulysses was written by the early modernist and published in 1922. And although the book was deemed very controversial at the time, it later became one of the masterpieces of 20th century literature. The entire book is set on a single day. And almost 100 years on, Ulysses is honored each year with Bloomsday celebrations. Which include dressing up as one of the characters in the book or simply according to the fashion of the early 20s. Fans start the day with the same breakfast as the protagonist Leonard Bloom eats fried livers, pork kidneys, mustard fingers and tea. People around the world also reenact their favorite scenes from Ulysses and the ones who flock to Dublin visit the places written about in the book. Now, joining us from London to talk more about Bloomsday and its originator is Andrew Gibson. He is a professor of modern literature and theory and is the author of Joyce's Revenge, a book which takes a look at the history, politics and aesthetics in Joyce's Ulysses. Thank you so much for joining me, joining me today, Andrew. Now, Andrew, no other writer that I know about is associated with one specific day. Why is it that we remember James Joyce and his book Ulysses on June the 16th? Ulysses is actually set on June the 16th, 1904, and only that day. It's about a single day, a single day above all in the life of three people. But it's also a book that evokes the life of a city, Dublin, and its denizens throughout that day. It's also packed, crowded with materials that were current at the time, contemporary material, whether it be popular culture, literatures, anthologies, advertisements, uh, music. Uh, that is all written into the novel, into its style and its language, styles and languages, as well as into its content and into its substance. For all of those reasons, June the 16th is um, always associated with Joyce and particularly with the central character, Leopold Bloom, as he wanders around Dublin, constantly noting what is going on on the streets of Dublin on June the 16th, 1904. It's worth adding, finally, that uh, June the 16th, 1904, was actually the day on which Joyce first, first walked out with the most important woman in his life, Nora mm. Barnacle, who he lived with before marrying and then eventually married um, uh, for many years. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrew, tell me about some elements of his literature that made him achieve titles uh, as the greatest literary modernist. Modernism in the arts meant breaking with traditional forms, traditional molds, traditional established ideas, partly be that because of um, historical change. So many changes were afoot in the early to mid 20th century. Joyce spectacularly breaks with traditional forms, though having already shown, as, say, Picasso did, that he could master them. Dubliners, his collection of short stories, is a supreme exercise in traditional realism. 
But by the time he moves on to Ulysses, and then even more his last great work, Finnegan's Wake, Joyce is breaking with uh, traditional forms of literature, thought, rethinking what literature can tell us about experience, culture, social and political life. In a certain kind of way, he recasts or rewrites literature. Mm -hmm. And he does it probably more adventurously, uh, more grippingly, and more variously than any other writer or artist of the 20th century. Hence the fact that Ulysses, in particular, is regarded as the great 20th century literary masterpiece. Well, taking that into consideration, what is it about this famously difficult novel that inspires so many people to celebrate Bloomsday? I think uh, that there are many different reasons for celebrating Ulysses. You say famously difficult novel, and of course, in some ways it is very difficult, at least to start with. But it's a novel that, as I said um, earlier, is rooted in ordinary daily life, ordinary daily experience, what goes through the minds of ordinary people, notably Leopold Bloom. Um, that, of course, is one reason why it's so celebrated. Another is that it's intellectually so daring um, that it, uh, that it as, I, as, as I said when I was talking about modernism, that it rethinks the world in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Another is its sheer breathtaking encyclopedic quality. There is simply so much in Ulysses, as there is again later in Finnegan's Wake, whether one's thinking about classical knowledge, knowledge of many cultures, of many literatures. Um, the range of awareness in Ulysses is really quite staggering. Mm -hmm. And so is the range of reference. Yes, Andrew, Joyce but said, of I course, want to go back to your enough reference. puzzles in it to keep the scholars busy for a thousand years and that that was his way of ensuring immortality. Well, certainly people will be puzzling over uh, the, uh, the enigmas, the cruxes of Ulysses for, I dare say, centuries to come. Andrew, I want to uh, just go back to your reference of how you said that Ulysses is uh, so famous because it's based on ordinary life, but there are a lot of novels that are based on ordinary life. Why is this one celebrated? Well, uh, other novels are celebrated too. Why is this one celebrated so, so widely and so enthusiastically? I suppose if we're thinking about Joyce's treatment of daily life, it has to do partly with the, way, the fact that he knows so much about everyday life, that it's so grounded, that it's always so particular, uh, that it, it's so saturated in ordinary life. For instance, Joyce actually wrote, he was living in Europe by, by the time he was writing Ulysses, of course, he wrote to his aunt to, to find out exactly how big the drop was behind a particular wall, how high the wall was, because one of his characters was going to jump down from it. The novel is full of that kind of precision. Um, and that, on the one hand, is what makes it such a remarkable portrait of everyday life. Mm. But also the fact, of course, that Joyce is so concerned with what goes through the minds of his characters. Uh, in particular, Leopold Bloom, though also Stephen Dedalus, Molly Bloom. He traces in the most minute detail how people respond to what is going on in everyday life. What it, the kind of way in which it manifests itself in consciousness, the way in which the kind of forms it takes in the mind. And that he, he does that so subtle and in su so subtly and in such a complex way that people have long been riveted by it, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Andrew Gibson, thank you so much for telling us about James Joyce and, of course, his amazing novel, Ulysses. <laughs>
At one of the world's best-known contemporary art fairs in Switzerland this weekend, it seems things are looking up for the art world. Carrie Alexandra has more on why Art Basel matters. Art Basel opened its doors to the public once more this weekend. The Swiss Contemporary Art Fair has been running for nearly half a century, showcasing both well-known and emerging artists from around the world. This year, 290 galleries from 35 countries represented more than 4,000 artists. Organisers said the atmosphere was optimistic this year after a recovery in the struggling art market in 2017. The market, as always, is very hard to generalise about. On the one hand, you have incredibly high prices being achieved at auction. On the other hand, you have a moment where the frenzy around younger artists has reduced a little bit. Uh, when it comes to classic modern and classic contemporary, I can say that the market is very, on a very high level, very stable. Um, and it's very selective in terms of price and quality. While the atmosphere this year may have been more positive, with art sales rallying in the last year, it was also perhaps more political. We will see more political art, because we have, we're living in a very political moment. More art from Africa or from the, the African um, diaspora. Um, because this is a moment where more and more of these artists are being discovered, but more and more galleries, more and more collectors are rising in these regions. Um, and of course we'll see more digital art, because more and more artists who are growing up in a digital sphere are starting to come in to the art world and play a real role. Although digital art made its mark this year, it was pieces in more traditional mediums, like this from artist Joan Mitchell, that sold for the big money, going for an eye-watering $14 million. Kerry Alexandra, TRT World, Istanbul. Still to come on Showcase, stepping inside the shoes of an icon. A story of style and suffering. Frida Kahlo's once-sealed personal belongings go on display for the first time outside Mexico. What's the name of this friend of yours? Oscar. <laughs> Oscar Wilde. Oh, Jesus Christ. A film depicts the years just before Oscar Wilde dueled with his wallpaper and said one of them had to go. We'll bring you those stories later in the show, but first, here's a quick look at a few other ones we've been keeping an eye on. Canadian police have released footage of the moment a man broke into a Toronto exhibit on Thursday and stole a work by the famous but anonymous graffiti artist Banksy. The print, titled Trolley Hunters, is valued at around $45,000. A police investigation of the theft is ongoing. Staying in North America, up until September, the New York Historical Museum will display objects that belong to some of the most celebrated illusionists of the 20th century. They include props used by David Copperfield during his stage shows, as well as items that helped escape artist Harry Houdini tango with death. In Turkey, a former Ottoman army barracks is set to become the country's largest library. The ruling AK party made the announcement as part of its election manifesto. It says it will convert the Rami artillery quarters in Istanbul into a library with a capacity of 7 million books. The project is scheduled to be completed by 2020. In the wake of the Obamas striking a deal with Netflix to produce original content, Apple says it has secured the services of talk show host and publishing magnate Oprah Winfrey. The tech giant says it's a multi-year deal, but has given no details about the type of content Oprah would produce or its date of release. A disabled woman who transformed her pain into art. Frida Kahlo is considered one of Mexico's greatest artists, but she's also celebrated as a feminist icon. And now, a London exhibition is showcasing her personal belongings, including her prosthetic leg, for the very first time outside of Mexico. From her art to her personal artifacts and clothes, 
Frida Kahlo, Making Herself Up, is the latest exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. It features more than 200 items that once belonged to the Mexican artist and marks the first time her possessions are on display outside of her home country. I think this exhibition is really special because it's, it's the first time we will see Frida as the persona. Frida, the artist, but also the woman. Um, I can tell you I met Frida personally for the first time when I went through her archive and I found a woman who loved perfume, who loved to dress up, who didn't let her disabilities define her, but she defined who she was in her own terms. Life wasn't easy for Kahlo. She suffered polio as a child and, at 18, she was severely injured in a bus accident that left her in pain for the rest of her life. Frida's identity, her appearance, her art are all wrapped up in the landscape of her disabilities. She lived her life in pain, but she transcended it. She distracted attention from her bad leg, from her uh, the injuries to her back by wearing brightly coloured, loose uh, country clothing. Whether through her artwork or clothes, Kahlo always found a way to celebrate Mexican tradition, and that's one of the themes the exhibition explores. Before these items went on show, they were locked away for more than 50 years in the Blue House, the home and now museum Kahlo shared with her muralist husband, Diego Rivera. I think this is a contemporary interpretation, but the main thing is keeps the, the spirit, keeps the originality and understand the intimacy of Frida Kahlo. Described as the most famous female artist in history, Frida Kahlo continues to influence generations of artists. To speak more about the critically acclaimed painter, I'm joined by Emma Dexter. She's the Director of Visual Arts at the British Council and has previously curated an exhibition on Kahlo and is the co-author of a book based on the Mexican artist. Thank you so much for being with us today, Emma. Now, we're so used to seeing uh, Frida's self-portraits and now there's an exhibition at the V&A uh, of her uh, showcasing her personal effects. Um, but at what point can we separate the art from the artist? Do you think that she gets all this attention because of her artworks or because of the life she lived and the image she created for herself? Um, well, I think absolutely in the case of Carlo that it's uh, for both of the reasons that you describe. Um, she's an incredible artist, um, but it's really hard to separate um, her life and how she lived it um, from the work that she makes. So I think, um, you know, perhaps with other artists, it's it's easier to separate the two things. Um, with with Frida Kahlo, it is difficult. She made paintings that were so raw and absolutely about. Uh, her body, her pain, um, her love affairs, um, that um, it, it's impossible really to, to almost talk about her work without that. Um, Diego Rivera, her husband, actually um, said that he couldn't think of another artist in art history who had torn open their chest mm -hmm. to reveal their and the biological truth of their feelings. And I suppose, again, in a way, that quote shows the fact that um, emotions um, and the body um, and the spirit were all very much tied up together um, in Carl's work. Well, Emma, as I said earlier, people are so used to seeing her self-portraits. Why do you think she used most of her artistic ability to create self-portraits? Um, I think it was very practical. Um, if you remember, she spent a lot of her life lying in bed in pain. She spent long periods in hospital. Um, and I think it meant that with the help of a mirror, she always had that uh, subject matter to hand. She, 
she created images from her own imagination, um, but she, you know, she could always revert to working on a self-portrait. Um, sometimes also there was a there was a very practical function um, when she uh, was traveling around the United States of America with her husband Diego Rivera when he was working on these massive, huge, astonishing murals in. Um, in, in Detroit and, and in other parts of the US. Um, there's a photograph of Frida Kahlo sitting sort of beside Diego working on this huge scale. And there you have Frida with an easel um, and a tiny, tiny painting that she is working on. Um, and um, I think you know that meant that she could travel with him all the time, but work work at the same time. And it was practical. Um, so. Um, Yes, I think um, perhaps, again, her work reflects her sense of herself as a woman um, and, um, yeah, was, was, was very portable, very portable and very practical. Yeah. Well, Emma Dexter, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left, but thank you so much for being with us today on Showcase. Oscar Wilde may be best known for his comedic style, but his final years were anything but. The famed Irish writer spent the latter part of his life in exile. And after years of aimlessly wandering around Europe, he died almost penniless in a Paris hotel room at the age of 46. A new film titled The Happy Prince is taking an unusually somber look at the otherwise flamboyant playwright. What is the name of this friend of yours? Oscar. <laughs> Oscar Wilde. Oh, Jesus Christ. The final years of one of the most iconic writers of Irish literature, Oscar Wilde, have been adapted to the silver screen. In 1895, five years before his death, the author of The Picture of Dorian Gray was imprisoned and sentenced to hard labour for two years for gross indecency. Today, you go too far, sir. No, you go too far, madam. And The Happy Prince focuses on his years in exile in Naples and Paris after his release. The crime of which you have been convicted. It took a decade to film to be done, but the writer, director and the lead star, Rupert Everett, is happy with the end result. It took years to um, get the, the movie off the ground and um, I think I finished writing it in 2007 and we shot it in 2016, so, or maybe even 2006. So it was a 10 year uphill struggle um, full of you know, disastrous setbacks always and things like that, which is par for the course in trying to get movies made. But um, it was, it was a, 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 a big effort in a way. And so to pull it off, and to get it through and to see it into a festival is like, um, you know, after a difficult pregnancy and a 24-hour labour uh, and uh, to be presented with the baby. I shall, under such circumstances, pass the severest sentence that the law allows. The sentence of the In the period leading up to his death, Wilde struggled as an outcast and dependent on an allowance from his estranged wife. <laughs> and the film sheds light on the artist's deteriorating health and tumultuous homosexual relationship with Lord Alfred Douglas. Everything, my family, my work, my freedom, everything. There's nothing left to take. What are you going to do, kill me? I'm already dead. I'm, I'm so excited about that. That's why I'm particularly proud to be part of this, because I thought I knew about Oscar Wilde and I had no idea about his suffering and... Mm -hmm. And I don't. I, I knew about his being in prison, you know, imprisoned, and and just like I'd heard about her suffering, but not, but not seen it or understood it. And I really, really think this will. I think Rupert talks about a very interesting point about the, the fact that he chose to face trial. I mean, very foolhardy in a way. He could have. Yeah. What most people did in that in that situation was to leave the country and go and live in exile but he would have faded into obscurity and his work wouldn't have been remembered. And that he chose persecution um, to, to take his place in, you know, in the literary history. The film The Happy Prince opens in UK theatres on Friday.
There's no mystery so great as suffering. But suffering is nothing when there is love. Love is everything. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode of Showcase. Make sure to tune in next time as we head to the Guggenheim to explore Alberto Giacometti's unmistakable aesthetic vocabulary. And we'll see what's on offer at this year's Shanghai International Film Festival. Until then, you can head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Efnan Han. See you next time. <laughs>